Welcome, Anchor family. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, we would love for you to fill out a digital connect card. This can be found on our website, theanchor.me. Fill it out, hit submit. We just want to get to know you better. Hey, Anchor family, if you're watching us in the local area, we want to invite you out here to the church for our time of corporate prayer happening every Wednesday from 5 to 6 p.m. Thank you so much for your generosity. Your giving makes it possible for us to spread the good news of Jesus to the world. Well, that about wraps it up for today. Thank you so much for being with us. Now let's dive in. Well, let's praise Him this morning. Let's bring our praise to Him. We bring our praise. You bring revival. Yes, Lord. We lift our hands.
praise ever be on our lips. Lord, may surrender to you always be, Lord, in our hearts. In your presence, God, is everything, everything, everything we could possibly need. Thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. So we know, God, we believe your word that you are here. We say, Lord, you are welcome. Just continue to have your way in this moment, in this time. Come on, say that.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another Anchor at Home. Last Wednesday night in Cultivate, which is our discipleship experience here at the church, we dove into a teaching entitled Life in the Spirit. Due to all the questions and all the positive feedback that we received after the night was over, I thought it might be helpful not only for those who were there, but also for all of us who are part of the Anchor family, uh, albeit in person or online, if we slowed down a bit and we revisited some of the biblical truths that we talked about the other night. My hope is that over the next few weeks, we can lay a solid biblical foundation uh, in our lives so that we can not only just understand, but so that we can experience uh, the full, the abundant, the purposeful and meaningful life that God wants you and I to live. So truthfully, I just think this, if you or I are going to experience the abundant life that Jesus wants us to have, then it's really important that we learn what we are going to talk about today. So I simply encourage you as we begin to stir up your hunger and lean in because I want to take a moment and I want to go line upon line, precept upon precept and teach you what it really means to walk and to live a life of the spirit. So to begin, I personally believe if we're going to enjoy a life in the spirit, then the first thing we need to understand is how we were made. So let's begin by looking at how God created us by looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It reads like this. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, obviously, when we read these verses, the words image and likeness automatically jump off the page, and rightfully so. But the other words I want us to notice today are the words us and our, because they are really key if we're going to understand how we were designed. You see, the words us and our point to the biblical truth that while God is still one. There are still three unique persons in the Godhead. Now we refer to them as who? As God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we as believers typically refer to uh, all of them as the Trinity or the triune or the three-part being of God. Let me give you a few examples. We see all three persons of the Godhead in action at Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3. So if you can just imagine with me, we know that we have Jesus, who is the Son of God, ascending up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descending out of heaven like a dove. And then we hear God the Father say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Let me give you another verse. We read this in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says how God, talking about God the Father, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. It says for God, once again, talking about God the Father was with him. And for a bonus, let's throw in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So once again, just as we saw in Matthew chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 10, we see each person of the Trinity being distinctly identified. Now, with all that in mind, what's the question? The question is this is if God is a three-part being and we were created in His image and in His likeness, then wouldn't it also make sense that we too are a three-part or a triune being as well? The answer to that is absolutely. But if I can be clear just right off the top, unlike God, we do not consist of three distinct persons. In other words, uh, you know, as individuals, we don't have a guy named Chuck and a guy named Willie and a gal named Sally that lives inside of us. If we think that, uh, then call us for prayer, right? Instead, what happens is with us, we actually consist not of three persons, but of three parts. 
The Apostle Paul not only affirms this, but he also identifies these three parts for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, when he said this. He said, May the God who gives us peace make you holy in every way and keep your, notice the next two words, your whole being. So what is our whole being? He goes on to say, spirit, soul, and body, free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as you can see in this passage, Paul identifies each part of our being, our three-part being, as a spirit, soul, and body. Now, if I can help bring some clarification to this, a lot of theologians word our three-part being in this way, and hopefully you'll find this helpful. But they say that we are a spirit. In other words, that's the real us, that we are a spirit, that we possess or have a soul and we live in a physical body. I want to say that again, that we are a spirit, that we possess a soul, and we live in a physical body. Now, if this teaching is new to you, uh, you know, I know this a lot of people. I've been actually born again and saved for a number of years before I ever heard this. So if it's new to you, I want to take a moment and just kind of break down our three-part being so hopefully we can understand. So let's start with this. Let's imagine that all of us that are watching right now, we're all in a room. When we looked out across the room, the first thing we would see would be our bodies. Because this is the part of our being that actually has contact with the natural world around us through our five senses, which are what? Our ability to see, our ability to hear, smell, taste, and touch. Our body is also the part of us that houses our soul and our spirit. As my uh, pastor has said for a number of years, that our body is, is nothing more than really our earth suit. And if we could come in and just add some biblical language to this, the Bible often translates our body as this. It refers to it as the outer man or, which is commonly known to all of us, the flesh. Like how many of us have ever uh, struggled with the flesh, right? Like all of us. The next part we have in our three-part being is our soul. This is the part of us that makes us unique because uh, this is actually where our personality is seated. So not only is our personality seated in our soul, but our soul also contains our intellect, or we can say our mind, our will, and our emotions. Once again, our intellect, our will, and our emotions are found here in the soul, or we can say this, that this is the part of our being that uh, allows us to think. It's where our desires and where our feelings are found. So if I can just say it this way, how many of you have ever been in a spot where your emotions have got the best of you? Once again, like all of us, right? So, and lastly, uh, but certainly not least, we have our spirit. Our spirit is the life source of our being, meaning when the spirit of a man uh, leaves a person's body or a person's house or a person's earth suit, their body ceases to have life. In other words, if the spirit leaves, the body, our physical body, our physical flesh will actually collapse to the ground. If you can maybe think back for a moment when Jesus was hanging on the cross, just for example, when he uh, prayed to the Father, he said, Father, I commit my spirit right to you. And we know as we continue to read that his spirit man left his physical body and his physical body that was hanging on the cross collapsed because the life source was gone. Now, if we could come back behind this and add some biblical language to it, our spirit is often translated as the inner man or one of my favorite ways, uh, the hidden man of the heart. I love the way that translates. Now, if I can, let me pause here for a moment. There are some who will argue that our soul and our spirit are one, meaning that we are a two-part being and not a triune or a three-part being. And I want you to know that our soul and our spirit are definitely the parts of us that are eternal. And that may be where a lot of the confusion comes in. But Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 makes it very clear that our soul and our spirit are two distinct and two separate parts of our being. Notice what it says. It says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the, key word, the division of soul and spirit. Now, again, the point is simply this. 
is if our soul and our spirit were one, then how in the world could they ever be divided? I believe the answer is, is they couldn't, right? And I, and I think as we just move forward in this teaching, not just today, but over the next few weeks, we'll begin to understand how and why our soul and our spirit are definitely two different parts of our being. All right, so let's get back on track. With all three parts of our being in mind, uh, let's back up all the way to the creation of man, right? We know the first man, his name was Adam. And let's actually read where God created him in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Once again, we're talking about uh, how we were made. It says this, it says, Then the Lord God formed, that is, created the body of man from the dust of the ground. Now, if I could pause there for a second... Did you know that it's actually scientifically proven that the substance of a person's flesh and a person's muscles and a person's bones uh, actually consist of the same elements as the soil in the ground? In other words, science discovered that. Now, I say that because to me, I think it's funny when science catches up with the Bible. In other words, it confirms it. And so there's proof that's here, right? But let's read again in verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed, that is, created the body of man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath or the spirit of life. And man became a living being, an individual complete in body and spirit. In other words, God created Adam's body from the dust of the ground. And then God breathed his spirit of life inside of Adam. And he instantly became a living soul. That is why Job 33 verse 4 tells us this. It says, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. But if we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and we continue to read beyond that verse, and I believe this is key if we're going to understand uh, life in the Spirit and how we were made, we find that God planned a garden called Eden, and then He placed man in that garden to tend it. If you keep reading, we find that once Adam was in this garden, that God actually comes alongside of him. He gives him guidelines or rules, if you will, to freedom that pertain to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then we see God declared that it wasn't good for man to be alone. And we know that he created Eve to be Adam's helpmate. And at this point in the narrative, here's the point I'm trying to make here. At this point in the narrative of the Bible, we see Adam and Eve whose spirits were alive in God and they were actively engaged with God, having unhindered fellowship and unhindered connection with their Creator. But as we continue to read on into Genesis chapter 3, we discover that when Adam and Eve disobeyed and uh, fell into sin in the garden by partaking of the forbidden fruit, that their spirits, get this, that their spirits, not their body, not their souls, but their spirits died and they became slaves to sin. Now, if I can be clear here, this doesn't mean that they lost their spirits and by doing so somehow became a two-part being. Rather, what they lost was this, is they lost their connection with God. They became uh, spiritually separated from God. The spiritual light went off in them, if you will. They were spiritually dead. The life of God was no longer in them. I'm trying to say it every way I can, so hopefully we understand the picture here. But it simply meant this. It meant because of the spiritual death that the only way that they could now relate to each other, the only way they could relate to the world around them, and ultimately the only way that they could relate to God from that moment forward was solely through their soul and their body. You see, because they had lost their spiritual connection with God, that meant that the one who was their source of life, the one who was their source of wisdom, their source of discernment, their source of guidance, or we can even say their source of light, they were now uh, forced to fumble their way through life in spiritual darkness. Now, how did they fumble their way through this spiritual darkness? It was pretty clear. They did it by what they thought, by what they felt, by what they desired. In other words, they tried to make it through life by the inconsistency of their soul souls. And also because they lost the presence of God, they were also now trying to feel that gaping hole inside of them by satisfying their lust and satisfying their desires. Now, of course, these lusts and these desires were based off of what they could see, what they could hear, what they could smell, and what they could taste. In other words, it was based off the cravings of their body. Now, get this. Unfortunately for us, because the Bible tells us that Adam was the representative for all mankind. 
that literally according to Romans chapter 5, we were all born by no choice of our own into this same spiritual death, this same spiritual bondage, because we too were born with a lack of connection with God. So in the same way that Adam, like a chip off the old block, we too were spiritually blind, deaf, and dumb, and we began to try our best to live this life, even as children gain, from our souls and from our bodies. If you can, just think back with me for a moment and just be honest with yourself. Think about how much your soul and how much your body dominated your life before you surrendered your life to Jesus. Like, think about how many times when something would happen in your life, you, you just lost it emotionally, and that was your way of coping. Think about how many times that stress would come into your life, and the first thing you did, you did was run to a, a refrigerator, or you run to a cabinet so you can somehow feed the cravings of your flesh to try to deal with life. You know, I think so often we think about the body, we simply think about it as an addiction to sex or an addiction to porn or an addiction to a drug or an addiction to alcohol. While all those are certainly true, there, the fact is, is there are many ways that we uh, have allowed in our past for our flesh and for our soul to dominate our lives. And once again, to think, why do we do that? It's pretty simple, gang, because once again, we were operating on spiritual death. We were operating from a sin nature, and we were trying our best to live through spiritual darkness. In fact, listen to how Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He said this. He said, as for you, you were spiritually dead in your transgressions and sin, which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Who's the ruler of the kingdom of the air? It's obviously Satan. And then he says this. He says, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. Verse 3 is our key verse. It says, all of us also lived among them at one time, doing what? Gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. So we could just add, literally following our soul and our flesh. And the fact is, my friend, is this, is that this, according to what we're reading here, is why we were all empty and so unsatisfied because we were never created, never designed by God to live from our soul and from our body. Rather, we were actually created to live a life from our spirit. And the reason we know that is because John chapter 4, verse 24 simply says this, God is spirit. Therefore, we were created to live this life as ones who are dominated and led by the Spirit of God. Think to what it says in Romans for a second. It says basically all of those who are led by the Spirit of God are the mature sons and daughters of God. All right. So with all that said, while clearly all of that is super unfortunate for us, right, that we were born of the seed of Adam, uh, I believe today that, man, there's a good news piece of this, and it's this. While we were unfortunate there, man, we were fortunate enough to know that, man, God loved us enough to send Jesus. And what I want to do for a minute is I want to turn the corner and I actually want to look at what happened on the inside of us the moment that we gave our lives to Jesus Christ. If we can, let's pick back up in Ephesians chapter 2. We read verses 1 through 3. Now we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. It says this. It says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. Like, thank you, God, right? It says in verse 5 that even though we were spiritually dead because of our sins, right? Everything we just talked about, he gave us spiritual life when he raised Christ from the dead. And then last says, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So Paul is clearly telling us that the same part of us that died, our spirit, when sent into the world, he's saying that's the same part of us, once again, our spirit that received life the moment that we believed in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So what was dead in the first Adam has now been made alive through the second Adam or the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Now, you can call me crazy, but I actually believe in many ways this life-giving, this life-giving moment, this salvation moment isn't that different from the one the disciples encountered in John chapter 20. Now, if I can preface it with this, this is after Jesus rose from the dead, and it's after the disciples fleed from him and began to live once again from their emotions and their soul, their old ways. 
And then we know as we read the story, Jesus is obviously gathering back in. And then it comes to this incredible moment. In verse 19 it says, That Sunday evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And it says they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he, this is the whole reason we're reading this, then he, like with Adam in creation, breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Or we could say this, that he literally breathed on them and they received the Spirit of of life. Now, if I could throw my words in there for a moment, I would say this, that at that moment, their spirit man received a Holy Ghost, a Holy Spirit uh, resuscitation. Now, I don't mean a resuscitation that you come back to life for a moment and you die later. No, no, this was a resuscitation that was marked and characterized by eternal resurrection and eternal life. All right, before we move forward, I actually want us to look at one more passage of Scripture because I actually believe this will help us gain a greater understanding of what God has done for us by bringing us back to life. The passage I want to look at is found in John chapter 3, and it's when Nicodemus encountered Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 1, please. It says, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. And then it says in verse 3, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again. If I can add what the Amplified Bible says here, it says, unless you are reborn from above, unless you are spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified, you cannot see the kingdom of God. If I can maybe pause here for a moment, when we read that scripture, please understand that we can do as many good works as we would like, but good works do not bring life to the Spirit. So good works do not get us entry into heaven. That it's literally only by being born again can we spend uh, eternity with God. So let's pick it back up in verse 4. Look at what Nicodemus replied. He said, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. This says in verse 6, humans can reproduce only human life. That's what it means to be born of water. It says, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to what? To spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain. I want to add the mystery of how people are born of the Spirit. Here's the main takeaway that I hope all of us grab today. To put it plainly, the part of us, our spirit man, that was completely dead, completely void of the life of God, totally disconnected from our Creator, the moment we said yes, once again, to Jesus and everything He did for us, we were not only forgiven of our sins and given away to heaven, and if I could just maybe add here, you know, unfortunately, so many people of the Christian faith stop right there. Like they stop with the fact that, yay, my sins are forgiven. Yay, I'm on, way, on my way to heaven. But guys, let, let's understand that Jesus did so much more than just forgive us of our sins and give us an entryway into heaven. Because we know that literally at that moment, according to what Jesus was telling Nicodemus, that the real us, that our spirits were actually supernaturally transformed on the inside of us. Now, by supernaturally transformed, I mean this, that once we were born again, our spirit man, the real us, became, just as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, our spirits became brand new. Listen to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you will. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
Now, please understand by all things, it doesn't mean that somehow our bodies change. It doesn't mean even our soul changed. The part of us that became new is our spirit man. In other words, when this guy got born again, I didn't grow seven inches and get big old muscles and become all handsome and stuff. No, no, that wasn't the part that changed about me. The part that changed about me was my spirit. And even though everybody around me maybe couldn't see it, man, everything inside of me was screaming that something was different. And why? because the life of God had come inside of me. So I just think this, we can understand the parts of us that have been made new. It's this, that our spirits have been made perfect before the Father. Notice I didn't say our flesh, I didn't say our soul, but our spirits have been made perfect before the Father. Literally in our spirits is as if we have never sinned before. That uh, literally, why? Because it has been made in the likeness of God. That we are now united. That we are now one. We can't get any closer with God than we are right now. There, there's no longer a disconnect. We are no longer separated. The light is turned on and it's going to stay on. And that literally all systems are a go. That the Holy Spirit has breathed God's life inside of us. That the God's life now flows through us. That we have complete access to His presence. And we can hear His voice and we are spiritually alive. If I can maybe stop here for a second. The other morning I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, can you please give me uh, some kind of way to be able to explain that of kind of what that means in terms that hopefully everybody can understand. And immediately uh, this is the thought that came to my mind. I have, I have three boys and uh, from time to time, if it either be Christmas or their birthday or just somebody wants to bless them, we, we've had people come along and they've bought remote control cars for our sons. Now, it's funny that, you know, we get this toy, they get this toy at the house and, uh, you know, it's got batteries in it, man, lights are going off, some of them transform, some of them are fast, some are slow, some of them got big wheels, some got little wheels, but whatever, these things are uh, bumping into the furniture, they're bumping to my legs and, and, you know, for days this is going on and thankfully after a few days, if you're a parent, you get this, the batteries die and, and all the lights go away, all the sounds go away, uh, it's no longer hitting you, it, you know, all of that annoying stuff is gone, right? Uh, but, but what's so funny is, is how the boys will still take that same vehicle and they'll go around the house and now instead of it making noises, now they're making noises and, and they're trying to do the thing. But the truth is, is the remote control car is kind of like it's lost its luster. It's lost its life. It's not as cool as what it once was. Until what they do is they go to their mom and they ask mom to either take them to Walmart or, or order them some batteries off of Amazon. And when the batteries come in or when they come back from the store, they put new batteries in that thing. And immediately the lights are on, the sounds are going, the thing's fast again, the thing's going all over the place. What's the point I'm trying to make to you? is that God created us like that car at first. In other words, at all the bells and whistles. Man, man, we were, we were connected with Him. There was life. It was happening. But at the fall of man, it was like the, the batteries of a man went dead. And even though uh, it could still function, just like that car could still roll, but, but it wasn't as exciting. The luster was gone. You, you know, the life was out of us completely. But the moment we got born again, the Holy Spirit came and He breathed life. He breathed fresh batteries into us. And in an instant, we were back running of how God actually created us to be. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have challenges, but once again, uh, life is inside of us again, which means we no longer have to relate to each other. We no longer have to relate to the world around us, and especially we don't have to relate to God anymore through the instabilities or the inconsistency of our souls. You know, if you think about it for a moment, if you're married, if you have kids, you no longer have to respond through your soul. If you're living your life, you don't have, no longer have to respond through the flesh. And, and if I could just say this, uh, for so many people, they base their salvation off their soul instead of understanding what the Word of God says. The Word of God simply says that my spirit bears witness with His spirit that I am a child of God. And I just think, thank God that our salvation is not based off of our feelings, but it's based off faith in what the Word of God says. And if I can also add this, this means that we no longer have to find our meaning of life and find fulfillment in life through the flesh, right? That we no longer have to fumble and stumble our way through spiritual darkness. 
because the light of God is now inside of us. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs, it says that the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. Guys, I want you to realize that all these things that I'm throwing at you at this moment, that is the abundant life. This is actually what it means to walk in the life and of the spirit and walk in the spirit that God's given you. So let me end with this. As great as all that is, and I realize that there's probably many of you still sitting there thinking, uh, Pastor, if that's the case, if that's the kind of life that God has given me, uh, then why do I still struggle? Why do I still wrestle with so many things? And I want you to know today that that's only a good question, but it's an extremely important question that we'll answer next week. So if you can, please come back next week and join us for another Anchor at Home. Let's pray and we'll be done. Father, thank you for every person that has joined us today. Father, I simply ask that you would come and you would open our minds and open our hearts, that you would allow us, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, to have a spirit of revelation, a spirit of understanding, to know what you have done for us, body, soul, and spirit. God, that we would literally begin to realize what you really did for us, past forgiveness of sins, past, uh, you know, a ticket to heaven of what you've really provided for us in our spirit. And so, Father, today, I just simply ask that as we progress throughout the week, that as we find ourselves reading the Bible, that we will literally begin to grab a hold of scriptural proof and spiritual truths, God, throughout the Bible, through your voice, that points us back to the life that you've called us to live. Father, we love you, and we ask, God, that this would take hold in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless you.